Mr. Wallington, you'll see, like these pictures below show, a very spread out place with stuff today everywhere across the freeway, uh, along 99, up and down and around a lake we call the Lake at the Commons. It doesn't look anything today like it did in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So again, in the 30s. And the 30s. <laughs> and we'll go back to talk about what was it like in those days because we do have folks today with us on the stage here who were born here, living here, grew up here, or even came later. I didn't come till 1972, and I'm a newcomer, only 50 years. So I don't know all this history except from what I've learned from Lois Martinazzi here to my right and from Sandra Carlson, who's Sandra Lafke Carlson, who grew up here. Her father had a farm down on Boone's Ferry. And we have Art Sasaki over here on this end, whose family grew strawberries, among other things, on Lower Boone's Ferry, down further south. And we have Mike Hannigan on the far, your far left audience. And Michael, for those who came in the 70s, 80s, or whenever, might have remembered getting their gas pumped at the Hannigan gas station on Boone's Ferry, right in the area that we're talking about. We're focusing just on a narrow slice of Tualatin today along Boone's Ferry where it curves and starts at Key Bank, you might say, and turns around by what we used to call Rich's Kitchen. Now it's another building called uh, the Mashita Teriyaki and the VFW, but all the way down to where this building stood uh, near McDonald's today on Boone's Ferry. That's our focus. But let's start at an earlier time, like Lois mentioned. When she was here, the town was very small. You might even not call it a town. It was a village, and there were not many businesses here. In fact, so Lois, where, you're, you have a mic there, there to use, by the way. So where did your family have to go for services of, like banks, or a bigger grocery store or something in those days, earlier times? Well, we would go to Sherwood for uh, medical care. Uh, there was no doctor or dentist in Tualatin. And uh, sometimes we'd go over to Tigard. There was a dress shop in Tigard on Main Street called Eckmeyer's. I'm sure nobody remembers that. But th there were no other stores uh, that you could get that type of thing, clothing or anything. And um, so, uh, Sherwood and Tigard were, and then of course there was the bus stop down by the White Store, and you could drive, you could go into Portland, and we did that a lot. And of course there were two railroads. Oh yeah, the, the only city in, in uh, the country with two railroads for a, a long time. But those were not actually running in the 30s and 40s for passengers, more than freight, mostly freight. Yeah, passengers, yeah. That, right. So down here on the end is Art Sasaki, like I mentioned, farm family, and uh, so, Art, uh, what do you remember? Where did you shop in those earlier days that you remember before you came downtown Tualatin, so to speak? The history that I'm familiar with is shortly following World War II. In other words, I was born in a relocation center in Idaho in 1944. In 1945, my family, after three and a half years, came back to Tualatin. And there was a certain amount of uh, anti-Japanese sentiment still prevalent, uh, not as bad in Tualatin as it was in Hood River County, where most of the anti-Asian legislation in the state of Oregon emanated from. But I remember my dad mentioning um, two instances uh, that kind of illustrate the situation. Fred Bunk's gas station was right next to the white store and it uh, was owned at that time by somebody who didn't particularly want to sell to uh, Japanese people. So Fred Bunk would run over and buy groceries and give it to my dad even though the owner of the white store knew that it was for my dad. And the other one, which is a little more poignant, uh, involved the little gas station grocery store in Durham, right by the railroad track. And uh, was it the Borland family that owned that, Lois? Borland, that owned that little grocery store? Anyway, 
My dad, after the war, stopped there and asked if he would sell groceries. And the man told him, you know, if you're the last customer I have, I'll still sell to you. And because of that, my dad would go out of his way once in a while to fill up with gas there, even though it was considerably more expensive than other gas stations because of the, the fact that he was willing to sell groceries. Good. Can I add something to that? Sure. <clears throat> my sister told me that, that when uh, the, the, the Sasaki family was coming back to uh, Tualatin, to their farm, that the local farmers got together and went up there and cleaned up the place. My sister told me that, that Daddy took a horse and wagon up to the Sasaki place and helped with other farmers to clean up the place. I was ha proud to hear that. So in those days, Tualatin was so small that everybody knew everybody and helped each other in time of need, I'm sure. That was just the way life was in the early times. Like I said, when we came here in 72, I think there were stop signs, but I don't recall a stop light. And I do remember we had to go elsewhere to buy groceries. There was one store, and uh, Kmart was then being built for the first time, and that's what I remember when we came. Now that's long been taken over by another big shopping center. So again, today we're focusing more on Boone's Ferry area. And I know that uh, the Lafke family down on the southern part of Boone's Ferry had a farm too, and you remember coming there as a girl, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, visit your grandparents? Yes, in the 40s. And, uh, um, I, yeah, we lived in Portland at first, and but we would visit my grandparents on their farm, which was on Boone's Ferry. And, um, and actually, talking about stores, they, I know during the Depression, they would put out some of their produce and maybe extra milk from the cow out on the road for people to come by. And I guess they would trust people to pay for those things. Um, but I remember going, at, we, we moved out to Tualatin in about 1950. And I remember walking just a couple of blocks down Boone's Ferry to the corner store, the brick store, um, which was, um, I think, originally the Robinson store, which is now Machida's. And, uh, and it, was kind of, it was a variety store. They had food, but they also had toys and, I think, some hardware. And um, the, yeah, the owner was Claude Keys. And, um, and it had a little window in the back of the store that was the post office then. So, um. Great. So let's go down here to Michael a minute. Now, Michael, be a real youngster here in this story, because you were the, were the last of the Hannigan boys working at the station. Yeah, I, I was. Um, yeah, I'm 67, and I, I'm, yeah, I feel like a kid. <laughs> 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 but, they were still kids. <laughs> but yeah, um, so the, the, the service station was actually started in the 30s, um, and my grandfather took it over sometime in the 30s, I'm not sure what year, and then in, I believe, 1949, my, my father took it over, and then in the mid, uh, late 70s, my brother took over the business. So yeah, it, it, it was around for a while. You worked there a lot, though, right? I, yeah, I started working when I was uh, 15, and I worked all the way through high school and was working 60-hour days in the summer um, to put myself through, through college. So I came out of school debt-free back then and had a brand-new vehicle. It was great. <laughs> but it, it was certainly different because you did know everybody in town. <clears throat> and um, I've got some other stories, but I don't well, know. Well, let's remember those stories. But I remember one thing that Don Sylvie told me. The Sylvie family had the lumber yard here for many years, right along Boone's Ferry also. But uh, Don Sylvie was saying all the, there were maybe three stations in there, three gas stations, or maybe two at least in those day, early days. I remember three, but <clears throat> one of them closed, quit selling the gas but and I, went into mechanics. But I remember that the, the Don, Don said the nice thing about the, the stations in those days was the kids could all come, bring their bikes, get their air pumped up, get some welding done to fix their go-karts, all at just part of the being the part of the family. No charge. In those days, that was just the way it was. Everybody helping each other, right? 
I want to add a little bit because um, Mike's dad, Vic Hennigan, I knew real well and we interviewed him. He was the nicest guy. Well, all the Hennigans are nice. I hate to say that, but <laughs> just, they get a big head. But uh, I always said that uh, for the Hennigans, you get service with a smile. They're always so nice. And Vic told me that uh, across from his station, which would be on the other side of Nyberg Road, right on that corner, there was a, a blacksmith shop when they first came. And he worked there, and he made the handles, those iron wrought on handles, for the old church when it was down there. Vic, your dad told me that. Okay. All right. Sandra, any more stories from coming out to Tuala, now living here, or then living here? Oh, yes. Um, well, May's Cafe was, I think, just right next to the brick store on the corner. And... Um, and they had, you know, it was a small place, but good food, spaghetti and hamburgers. And um, Diane Swintek told me recently that uh, whenever, she, she grew up here too, and so when she was a, a child and uh, she and her siblings or her friends would go to May's cafe whenever they had a really good report card and May would give them each a free ice cream cone for those good marks. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I remember the, um, the Garrett store, the Garrett family was just a wonderful family. And um, that was, I think, originally Robinson's Confectionery in the early 1900s. Um, but it beca eventually became the Garrett's grocery store. Uh, and there's also... Uh, tales about the how how nice they were and how they had a display of comic books that they sold for ten cents a piece, and they would let the the village the town children come in and read those comic books without charging them <laughs> any money. So. And I think that's the same building. When we came in '72, I would take the bus from in front of that white store down to work every day in Portland. And there was a store that was created called Milk and Honey Co-op. And does anybody remember that? Milk and Honey oh, yeah. Co-op. Yeah, I remember Yes. That. Okay. And uh, it was a lot of, it was a variety store, you might say, too. But a lot of uh, groceries of various healthy things, bulk foods you could get. I, somewhere in there, there was a locker. We called them lockers, freezers that you could rent. And, and have your frozen goods there and go and pick up as you needed it. Now, I'm not sure it was the same building that the freezer... Now, Larry, you're getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the white store, which, incidentally, the white store and the brick store were on opposite uh, ends of the block, and they were originally both owned by Robinsons. We don't know if they were related or not, but they were both Robinsons. Now, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, the meat market. Uh, the meat market was right next to right. the this service station. Uh, Walt Hawkshurst had a meat market there, and uh, he, there was, and there nobody at that, at that time even had a home freezer, uh, and so people would uh, rent a locker, you know, a, a freezer locker, and then put put their meat in there, and you'd butcher a cow or something, and have have the meat in there. And uh, one time when I was a new bride pretty young. I went in there and, and I bought some wieners. And Walt said to me, how are you going to cook those? I said, oh, uh, boil them. He says, no, no, no. Just simmer them very lightly. So he, he knew my family. His daughter was a good friend of my Aunt Kate. So, but uh, the meat market was really, really important to Tualatin. Yeah, that was the white store, the meat market, and then... Oh, the shake shop, and then the meat market. Shake, shake shop was there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to also... What? I want to also say, if you don't mind me, that that little store that was that Mays Cafe, mm -hmm. that, that happened to be, uh, it went through many, many um, changes. It was a residence. It was a, a variety store. It was a radio shack where they fixed uh, radios and TVs. And uh, it, yeah, it was a variety store. I remember old um, Kaduk, Johnny Kaduk. Nobody here would remember him, but he lived in that little place in, a, in the 40s. So, Art, <laughs> I'm sure you've triggered some things to say, but I want to also pause for a moment to, for our audience. 
Thank you for coming. And I also want you to be thinking of any questions you might have later or any time. If you raise your hand, I'll repeat the question. We can ask our panelists here or someone in the audience might know the answer. I see Bill Avery here. Avery Chicken Hatchery, famous family here in town oh, yeah. who uh, could say not probably as much, maybe around, I think your products from the Avery farm went out to Portland and elsewhere and around the country, baby chicks. But anyway, I remember the story of uh, the post office here in town shipping the ch chicks from the Avery farm around of the world, wherever they were going, and it, it sounded like quite a chorus in that post office when those boxes of baby chicks were being ready to ship out. But anyway, be thinking of that if you'd have a question, and later on, you might want to come look at these posters that we salvaged from the city of Tualatin as they were going to dispose of them several years ago. And we also have some pictures we'll pass around for the audience, some close-ups of the downtown area then. In 1951, a pilot from Sherwood said he would take photos of Tualatin, and he did, and we're going to pass them around for those who are here yeah, to yeah, see yeah. closer what, uh, what those are. And one of them has labels on it, too. So anyway, that's what's going to happen. So let's go back to Art a minute. Art, some more stories. The Garrett store, uh Charlene Garrett was in my class uh, at Tualatin Elementary School, and uh, she had an older sister uh, also. But an interesting side note, Owen Garrett, who uh, was a dad, was a World War II uh, survivor of the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. He was captured by the Japanese and did the, what it was, a 100-mile walk or whatever that many did not survive. But Owen was a survivor of the Bataan uh, Death March. OK. Just talking about what things used to be, a moment ago, Lois mentioned what had been in this place before or whatever. When we came, I remember the old brick building, the old store, Robinson store, now Mashita, had in my lifetime now, remembering what was in there, there was a rental place, renting equipment of some sort or things. Uh, there was the famous Rich's Kitchen. That became well known in the area for Portlanders even to come to Tualatin, a destination place to eat out. And upstairs at Rich's Kitchen was a jazz uh, music area. They often had jazz anyway. I forget the famous actress or actor, musician, who owned that? Do you remember? Anybody remember that? Who, who Rich was? He, he was a drummer for some band. Yeah, he, he was uh, for Rick Nelson. Okay, Rick Nelson, yeah. Oh, was that Sun Home? Hmm? Sun Home? No, no, no. Oh. Okay. So anyway, a uh, number of these buildings had different lives, like we've heard. And the church that we're in today, the now Historical Society building, uh, when we left this building, I, w I was a church member here when it was moved to its new location, and afterwards came other church, a wedding dress store, uh, other uses of this building, till it finally came here, thanks to the city of Tualatin and others in the city, helping fund this move. But anyway, things change, and we have to get used to that, and many of those buildings that we used to remember in this area are now part of the lake down there in Tualatin, uh, part of the urban renewal. Next month in February, there'll be a program here about the urban renewal that happened, why that happened to improve our facilities underground and outside to make this a more livable place. Sandra, any more stories? Yes. Um, I, we were, when we lived down on Boone's Ferry when I was um, a child, uh, we lived next to the Prices, Dick and um, Delphine Price. Uh, her nickname was Pete, and they had four children, yeah, uh, who were about my age, and so we played together a lot. But Dick, um, Dick was the carpenter in town. Yes. And he, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't have a, he, he had his own shop on the property behind their house, and um, they had a deep yard, so a lot of, 
uh, us kids in the neighborhood would spend time in their backyard playing and climbing trees. Um, and we, we could even go in their house. You know, they were just very welcoming. But the one place we couldn't go to was Dick's shop. You know, that was off limits because it had a lot of machinery and tools, dangerous tools. So, um, but they were wonderful people and he built um, a lot of the residences in, in Tualatin. He built our back. house. He built your house. He built our house when we moved up um, out of the floodplain. <laughs> and my mother wasn't going to spend another winter after the, I think it was the 56 or 57 flood. So, uh, and he built my grandparents' uh, retirement home after they left the farm. So, um, yeah, Dick Price. Can I say something? Um, <laughs> On, on next to the uh, brick store, going toward the bridge, of course, there was a feed store. Remember the feed store? And of course- I remember the people at the feed store. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I do too, yes. <laughs> well, anyway, the, the, brick, the feed store was originally on the corner, and then the Smith family who had built it moved it east and built a brick store from the brickyards here. But anyway, as a feed store, it was really fun. Horses and wagons. Clayton Nyberg was known to be, he could turn those horses on a dime and back, back his uh, trailer up to the, to the landing here. And um, they sold everything, you know, dog food, chicken food, bales of hay, straw, everything. And, uh, what's that? All those blocks you used for fires. And anyway, there was an old gentleman that used, and Sandra knows him, uh, that used to sit there on the, on the ledge of the dock of the feed store. And uh, he wore, a, he was short and heavy, and he wore uh, striped build overalls. Yes, yes, yes. And my kids used to call him the potato man. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, what? what was his name? Wayne Lundy. That's right. And then next to that, further east, was uh, what is now the CI. But uh, when I was a kid, it was Kate and Matt's, uh, Kate and Matt's, uh, place is what they called it. And originally my dad said it was a, a, a restaurant in the 30s. So Kate, Kate, and, uh, Kate and Matt Herberholtz owned that and it, and it turned into a bar and everybody uh, would come there. They had ball games down on Nyberg Road. They had a big ball field and everybody would come after the uh, ball game and, and talk about the game and they drink a little beer but it wasn't a big drinking place. Um, but uh, it, was, it was pretty important. Uh, then, then um, and then from uh, Kate and Matt, then uh, the Grisman, what's the, uh, Gleason, what's the name? Chisman, Chisman family bought the place and turned it into this spot. And what a spot it was. <laughs> and through the years, uh, gosh, it just was fabulous. During the crawfish parade, the bikers would come in, you know, and uh, take, take, the, take over the place. But it was... It was, I want to say something that John, um, John Brown's wife, Jane, told me, that John was the principal of the grade school. I'm sure a lot of you remember him. And when he hired a new teacher, or when a new teacher was hired, he would tell them, never ever buy your beer at Garrett's store, and never ever go into the spot tavern. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there's a bit of trivia about that building this, where it, we call it today the CI, Country Inn, was the initials, the spot. There's still a brass little identifying plate at the front door called the spot mm -hmm. on, in the yes. sidewalk, in the concrete. So there's a bit of history that some of you may not know, and that's just something, the trivia for the day. Well, they were all, uh, the spot tavern, well, I think, it became the CI. Yeah. But it was actually, uh, they talked about it on um, the Jay Leno show. Does anybody remember that? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Nobody's been shot here in 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two, two murders. Two murders there. At least. Two, two, what? At least. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just, I just want to go back to those meat lockers yeah. and the meat market. We, I still have those lockers, uh, probably three sets of them in, in the basement at, ha at the house. <laughs> when, when, when the Fergusons bought the building and turned it into Ferguson's Market, they took out the meat market and they, um, they were selling the, the lockers so Dad bought some for storage. No, 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 they're, they're just storage bins, you know. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Oh, and we didn't talk about the shake shop. What about it? Well, it was, it was where the meat market is, right. wasn't it? Yeah. So, and uh, uh, some of the Barngrover family owned that. It wasn't, their name wasn't Barngrover, but yeah, it was, a, it was a great place to go for kids because kids couldn't go to, this, to the bar. Uh, although they did used to, wait a minute, they had a barber shop on one side of the, the tavern, and the other side was a tack shop, I think. Uh, oh, they sold ice cream. It, it moved. It was different things in different times, you know. People moved out, and, but you could get an ice cream cone there. We used to get ice cream at the White Store. A nickel, a scoop, a dime for two scoops. <laughs> well, I remember Don Silby saying the best hamburger in the world was May's Cafe yeah. for a dollar and a quarter. Mm -hmm. Now, here's some, I see some heads shaking out there, agreeing. I want to say again, if you have something you'd like to add, we will hand you the mic to talk about it. I saw your head shaking a minute ago. Bill, you're over there. You grew up here, Bill Avery. Uh, are there some stories, questions you might have for our panelists? Well, the one thing I can mention is that uh, the Imperial. I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. So yes, the Hannigan's service station was more than anything, it was also a fix-it shop. So anyway, uh, Bill Avery here, like I mentioned earlier, is uh, from the family of Avery Farms. We have a street named Avery today, an important road. So Bill, tell us again what you were saying. Well, I could say uh, my grandfather moved out here in 1922, 100 years ago, and he bought a I think it's called the Francis House, which was built in about 1885, 1886. But on the farm, we, get, we got to be pretty independent. Like I said, we had a 500-gallon gas tank underground. And we had a, first it was a hand pump, then we finally got an electric one. But uh, we never had to buy eggs or chickens, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, and the milk. We grew up on drinking milk from one of our neighbors, unpasteurized milk, which was pretty common in those days. And the cow would eat the wrong thing, you'd find out in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we also had a generator about the, size, about the size of a Volkswagen. It was gigantic. And that served three families, you know, 10,000 chickens. And we had it mostly for the, because we had baby chicks. And as, as was mentioned, once in a while, I think in a big box, there were about 100 in a box, and a few, not a lot of them, but a few of them were shipped out around the country. I don't think we ever shipped them, but we got, my dad got letters from Brazil, Japan, and all over the United States about, because we had our own pedigreed line of chickens and so forth. But like a lot of farmers, they're somewhat independent, so, a lot of the grain was delivered in big trucks. And I don't remember much about the feed store in Tualatin because we would go into southwest Portland near the Ross Island Bridge to buy the special things for the chickens and everything. But uh, I do remember the corner store because there was a post office in the back and it was a, sort of a general store. I had a lot of things there. But I would. I, would, I didn't live in right in downtown area like some people, so I'm not as familiar with a lot of the places. I remember them, but uh, I didn't use them a lot. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody did mention the feed store, like we heard. And I just wanted to say for those who are here today and might not have heard, and there, that uh, the owner of the house next to us behind here, the Sweek House, now uh, on the Federal Register, protected in that way, but Althea Pratt. She died about a month ago now, and she is a story about how they, when she came in the mid-50s, she actually raised some cows over here and had their own milk, chickens, and others, and she d depended on the feed store for advice. She didn't know a thing about it all, but she learned it all by the feed store people helping her out and the county agent 
who was around in those days too. So the, that was, again, an important center of activity over there, commercial, dating way back when the railroads came. The farmers sent everything to Portland, right, on the railroad mm -hmm. in those days, and again, wagons before that. So our little area right here where we're talking, on Boone's Ferry, where, the, where you turn around the Mashitas today, that was a center of activity, all kinds of things. What was That little area right there by the brick store and <clears throat> through yeah. there. I hope I can add something to that. Um, <clears throat> I have a picture of my dad standing somewhere with some ladies around him. But they were teenagers or 20 or something like that. And I kept trying to look at that picture and see where was that? Where, where, where was that picture taken? And then I saw where he was standing. There was this strip. It was the scales. And that was right in front of the brick store because the farmers used to uh, bring their uh, horse and wagon and have, have it weighed, have the wagon weighed there at the store. And then, and then they go up to the uh, uh, railroad, uh, Southern Pacific, the, the one that went. East West. Yeah. And, and uh, unload, and then they come back and have it weighed again, and that's how they would know how much produce they had. And so if I hadn't seen that little strip, I wouldn't have known where they were. And then you can see the Smith House. Uh, the old folks right next door, uh, across from this, across from the brick store, there were houses all the way down to the park that belonged to the Smith family, and uh, then the, and then around the corner too. So the Smith family was really big. But you can read about that in <clears throat> my book. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. So if you were interested in Tualatin history, we have an uh, important book for you to think about sometime. We're going to have a new edition soon, but the co-author Lois here and. The aunt of Sandra Lafke Carlson helped write that book, the history, it's about that thick. It's well worth your money to learn about Tualatin history, as well as other books we have here today for your use if you ever want to learn more about the growth of this city and what's happened. Another big time, this time of the year reminds me, by the way, of floods, February, January, uh, later on, any time of the year almost in those days. but. Do some of you want to talk about the impact of the floods on the downtown area right here? Well, I can talk about probably the two most recent. Uh, one of them was in 73 or 4, uh, and that pretty much shut down all the businesses in downtown. Actually, there was another one I don't remember, but there was one in the, the 30s where uh, there's a picture, yeah. picture of my... Uh, there, there was a picture of my grandmother saying goodbye to my grandfather and uncle as they left on a rowboat out the front door. <laughs> and, and then there was the really big flood. What was it? Uh, 95, 96? 96. That, uh, yeah, covered the city park and, and some of this area down here and, yeah, flooded the basements of the uh, animal clinic. And, yeah, sh the, the water was up to about three feet up inside the service station. And cars' horns were honking because their circuitry was all uh, shorted out. So, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Okay. I remember the, uh, the flood in December of 56 or 57 because we were, my family was still living down here on Boone's Ferry in a little house that was lower than the elevation of the road. And um, mid-December, so we had our Christmas decorations up but the river started to flood and it started to come over the road in front of our house, um, come over Boone's Ferry. And so in the middle of the night, I remember um, my folks packing up and um, uh, Clayton Nyberg came with a truck and helped us move some things and move the Christmas tree with all its decorations on it and moved it up to the barn on my grandparents' farm and um, that was the last winter we spent there because my mother said she was not going to, to be there in another flood. And that, that flood came, I think it had flooded that little house in the 1930s, but it came within just an inch of flooding the house that time that we had to move out. So she wasn't going to spend another winter there. So we did move. All right. What, what more stories? One of the more curious things that I've always thought about, everybody talks about the dog food factory. 
but did anybody ever know anybody who worked at the dog food factory? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, didn't the, uh, Brink, Carol Brink work there? Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Willie Crossway? Yes. Yeah. Oh, everybody worked there. Well, they drove trucks, though, so they did. Yeah, but Rita Conover, uh, who was a barn grover, she worked there. Yeah, it was one of the only places to work in town. Yeah, you're right. I, but, you know, that name, you know, nobody called it the Hervin Company. Nobody oh. called it Blue Mountain. Nobody called it the plant. It was always the dog food factory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only in the summer when it's warm. <laughs> okay, Ed has a uh, dog question. Dog food factory. When our, we moved here in 73, maybe three weeks after the flood, before the flood. And so we went through that. But our daughter, when we drive by that, she, she was like, she called it the dog poop factory. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what Ed has mentioned is that when their daughter was three and they drove by the old factory, her comment was, that's the dog poop factory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we used to live, I used to live up on Borland Road, and we had a 4-H club, a horse 4-H club, and the kids, they, we had a, my, well, some of the leaders built a, a corral down by a Ferguson store. Um, where was Ferguson store? Uh, you? Your original one. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, uh, th and they would ride their horses down there to the corral, to the meeting, and, and the horses would always shy as they came down past, <laughs> past the dog food factory. <laughs> it was like they knew that their kin was in there. <laughs> their kin folk were there. <laughs> okay. Well, that, the dog food factory and the Jiggles sign were the two, <laughs> two things that made Paul. But, this is an aside. I have a fraternity brother who actually knew one of the Hervins, the, the owners of okay. Blue Mountain Dog Food. And the, the, their advertising was always kind of cute because the truck said going to the dogs, didn't it? Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, the Blue Mountain Dog Food. But. <laughs> He was in charge of advertising, and they came up with a scratch and sniff dog food ad <laughs> that they actually put in the Oregonian. Oh. The, 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 it was for the dogs that you could scratch the, 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 the ad and it would give the smell of dog food. <laughs> okay, any more questions or comments? We have a traveling microphone here. No, we're going to keep going. But before uh, the dog food factory, that area was a, a ball field. And uh, Twalton had a town team, and all the uh, Sherwood and Tigard had town teams. And everybody would turn out. We have a picture from 1948. And you could see all the cars lined up there. And after the ball game, then everybody, the adults, would go down to the uh, spot tavern and talk over the <laughs> game, over a can of beer or a glass of beer. Yeah. Uh, I see some other folks in the audience, just so we have for the record. Jerry Brosey moved here in the mid-50s, I think. So Jerry, you've heard some of this. Can you think of some memories you have of those 50s, 60s, early years? We'll give you the mic. You think about that. Any stories you would like, or the daughter. She was busy raising five children. One of those daughters, <laughs> with, one of those five children are here too today. Two of them are. Two of them, two of them, okay. Oh, oh, son, too. I want to ask Mike, do you remember how much gas was back then? How much was well, gas? Well, I, I remember the gas wars of the 60s, and I think we mm -hmm. got down to 27.9 was the lowest I remember it. Wow. But yeah, usually it was around 32.9. <laughs> but I, I do have a lot of memories of growing up, hanging out there, and the people that would come through. I'll, I'll get back to one of them. We but, went through to see, to see you and Rick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we were right, uh, for those of you that don't know, most of you do, you know, Twalton, or Nyberg Road used to come straight up to Boone's Ferry, and there was no Twalton Sherwood Road extension. So everybody coming to town, that was, or cutting through going to Sherwood, would have to come up past our station and then turn right or left. And uh, most people that were new would get lost, so they would be flying through between the pumps and saying, how do I get to Avery Street? How do I get to uh, Dura Metal? How do I get to Suburban Door? You know, and, um, but this one time in 1976, this 
big old Cadillac comes flying through, the fastest car I've ever seen fly through those pumps and just hit the brakes and stop. Guy rolled down his windows, where's Fulton Country Club? <laughs> and I look at him and I give him directions and then, and then he takes off and I go, oh, that was Jack Ramsey. That was his first trip. He had just gotten to Portland to, uh, yeah, as a, the head coach for the Blazers. So that was pretty exciting. Oh, wow. I just remember those gas wars and all of that. But our twins were born in 1973. And it was right about the time that the gas rationing was going on, so to speak. And you could only buy gas with certain even or odd numbers on your license plate. I, but I, more than that, I remember the flags the green flag and the red flag mm. for the days that that gas station was working. Do you, were you working then? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we, I, yeah I, I was in charge of the flags. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> and I was worried because I knew these twins were coming some point. We were never quite sure. I had to keep that tank ready because we had to go all the way down Portland. So anyway, we made it, but that was a story. And you and Ellie were singing in the choir. You and Ellie were singing in the choir, and she says, "I think I, I think I need to go." And they had the, yes. had, had the baby set sitting thing. right over here in the back of the choir member. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. I remember that. Oh, you know, my dad. Well, first of all, there there was a gas station also down by Bridgeport by the bridge. That's before your time, honey. Before my time. Yes. Um, and and um, so that area was called Bridgeport, even, even. Uh, so some little guy, I won't tell you who. Uh, let's see, where was I going with this? Oh. Uh, people used to say, oh, there was a, a house of ill repute uh, here, there, everywhere. And I asked some old man about it, and I, I said, was there really a house of ill repute there? And he says, well, BS, he says, but there was one down by Bridgeport, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> any, <laughs> any old questions out there now? Further questions? Yes, we have one here. I'll repeat it for you. Yeah, Chipotle, uh, Chipotle. Er, so it's Chipotle. Chipotle. Yeah. So the question was, was there an onion farm out near here? Yes, there was. Any further question on that? Is that it? Onion farms, yeah, the neighbors. Multiple, yeah. Oh, it's the perfect soil for onions, right, Lois? Well, well, absolutely. Can I talk about that for just a minute? Um, <laughs> the, the beaver dam soil was rich, deep, 20 feet deep. It, it was from the, the Ice Age floods coming down here and just depositing all that soil. And from the beaver damming the area, it was just rich, rich soil. And the farmers both here and, and in Sherwood would dig a ditch and, and drain, drain the, the water into the river and then plant uh, mostly onions in that, in that area. And it was, they were they were known all over the country for their beautiful onions. But then someone decided, oh, we need to save that for the birds. You know, let, let the birds have that land. And so that land was all uh, gone back to nature now, and we can't grow onions on that beautiful, beautiful soil. I hope the birds enjoy it. <laughs> we all have yeah. different Yeah, the onion flats, right? Yeah. Okay. Does all right. anybody know when Boone's Ferry Road was paved? Fulton, mm -hmm. downtown. Uh, was it always paved when the gas station was there? Well, I mean, uh, there are pictures, I think, where it was a dirt road. Uh, but I don't know when it was paved. No. It was always paved that you remember? Do you remember it always being paved? I think so, but I'm not sure. If you don't, uh, if you will excuse my, me, because I like to talk about the old times. Uh, my dad borrowed a we lived over across uh, from the, the other side of this uh, golf course. My grandfather lived up on Saggart Road. And Dad would borrow a horse and wagon from him. And uh, then he, when he would bring it back, why, he let me drive the horse. So he sat there and <clears throat> told me to turn, pull the reins this way or that way. And, oh, my God, I was so proud of myself. And so when we came in, you never saw cars there, hardly ever a car passed. So when I we drove into Tualatin, I was... <clears throat> looking here and there to see if anybody could see that I knew how to drive a horse. I was about nine years old. So we went up the hill by the school, turned on to, and then, and then I was going to pull the reins to turn on Saget Road, 
but the horse beat me to it. So the horse turned, and then the horse trotted right down, pulled right into the barn of my grandfather's place. That horse knew where he was going. I wasn't leading him at all. <laughs> I like that story. Yes. Oh, there, go ahead. Excuse me, Larry. There is um, a photo in the book, uh, Tualatin from the beginning, of them removing the logs that had been laid along Boone's Ferry horizontally. Um, th that was the first road. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were removing them, I assume, to, to pave the road, but I, I don't think there's a date on it, so. Well, the reason I ask, I remember when Boone's Ferry Road was paved in front of our house, which is three miles south of Downingham. Because it was a gravel road, two-lane gravel road. Interesting enough, uh, Everybody knew who was on the road because of the sound of the exhaust. Yeah. And, and there were so few cars that if your car went by, you knew who it was. <laughs> and interesting also was uh, which half of the road that people took. Grandpa Pennington's half was right down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew that. <laughs> There's a story about... There's a story about uh, Grandpa Pennington that he, he, he uh, drove his car down in here in front of the uh, lumber yard and stopped and went in. Uh, and some guy, some cop came in and said, whose car is out there in the middle of the road? He says, it's mine, and just went on about his business. He stopped right in the middle of the road. <laughs> so used to tell me that. What was his occupation? Was he also a, a doctor? He was a farmer. A farmer, OK. He had a peach orchard and a silver orchard. And Where the school at Tigard High School is now, or Tolan High School. Is now. He built a lot of those one and two bedroom houses right across the new high school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He, he came out from Missouri in 1920. So, and Merle was his son, Dr. Merle Pennington. Right. Okay. They had a lot of kids, very few of whom lived. Mm -hmm. I went to school with one of the daughters, Jan Pennington. Mm -hmm. Jan, uh, well, the dad had a, a doctor office in his basement. Oh. And I happened to be one of the patients as a little kid. And me too. <laughs> yeah, I think we all knew Pennington. Yeah. Yeah. But I ended up going to dental school with his daughter. Oh. Uh, and she's a couple years older than yeah. Mike and I. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the golf course. So, as I understand it, that's the second oldest golf course in the state of Oregon. Uh, it's a city within a city. And I wondered how it was part or not part of really the development of quality. Well, the was, course was built like in 1903. Uh, 1913, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was not in in the city limits at the time. Yeah. No. And you would think that the affluence of that, you know, the, the membership in that course would have helped the little city. Well, but it was it was a Jewish it was a Jewish club, and uh, I think restricted to Jewish because they could not play in in Portland if that was yeah. correct. Yeah, it's true, and oh, you know that because we caddied together, but. Um, Tualatin Country Club, while it may not have had an effect on the community at large, it was a huge uh, effect on our family. Uh, yeah, because we had a lot of the, uh, the members would come by and buy gas from us. Uh, if we needed something, uh, if we needed sports equipment, we would go down to uh, Kaplan's, and Kaplan's. they knew us and, and get a great deal at Kaplan's. Uh, the Rosenblatts, uh, Dr. Rosenblatt actually uh, uh, performed a surgery on my mom, and I don't think we had to pay very much at all for that. Um, Dad and my brother and me, we all caddied for the Rosenblatts when we had a chance. So, yeah. Well, Carl Haar, who, who lived right next to the golf course on one of the old Jurgens houses, uh, he was a caddy, and uh, Nicholas Ungar would come in his huge Lincoln and pick him up to be a caddy. Yeah. Ed? When I was in college, <laughs> so Ed is relating a story of uh, being a student and the kids from Lewis and Clark College uh, were, were using this course here. I believe so. Yeah. And uh, 
They didn't call them Mulligans, they call them Shapiros. <laughs> okay, all right. Any further comments or questions? Anybody else will hand you the mic if you want to talk with detail. I have a question for everybody out there. Does anybody besides me remember the uh, Great Tualatin train wreck? Train Nobody wreck? remembers the train wreck. In 19, I think it was 67, it was 67 or 68. Um, one o'clock in the morning, it was January, it was about, I think it was right around this time of January. Um, we had rented out the home that was next to the service station to one of our employees, Vic Vernon, and his wife was pregnant, and she woke up at one in the morning saying, okay, it's time to go to the hospital, and they hear this terrible noise outside. They open up the curtains and look out, and they see sparks flying up as high as the uh, power lines, and somebody had turned the switch, and uh, the train went to, off to the siding, hit cars that were parked on the siding, and all the cars, uh, the rail cars then went out in the field. We, it was a lucky thing. They went out in the field instead of into the city of Tualatin. Otherwise, downtown would have been wiped out. Oh, geez. But yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I'll bring photos next time. But, <laughs> yeah. We need that. Yeah. Nobody has mentioned the fire department. And the fire department was uh, right next to the, uh, this church when it was down on Boone's Ferry. And uh, it was the first city hall. Well, Yvonne likes to say it was the first city hall, but actually the first city hall was down here, but next to the, uh, what's now the police station. Uh, but anyway, the fire department uh, has a, a great history here in Tualatin. It was a volunteer. I guess they paid Margrover, who was the captain, but all the farmers, everybody, my dad was a volunteer fireman, and by God, when that siren rang, they dropped everything, what they were doing, and went to the fire, because they didn't know when it was going to be their barn that was burned. So it was very important to the community. And they got, they had, a, they would have fundraisers, they would have dances up at the school yeah. to raise money to, to buy uh, the uh, fire trucks that they needed. Oh, one thing about the fire truck, too, I want to say that down at Wonkers Corners, which was quite a ways away, there was a cat that climbed way up in a tree, and they called, they couldn't get it down, and they called the fire department, the Walton Fire Department, to come down there. And so they went down with their ladders. They got way, way up there. I finally got the cat and brought it down. Cat ran out in the road, a car ran over it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The fire department also sponsored Little League. We, we did not have much youth uh, That's right. support, or, but good for them, though. To, to, yeah, they were pretty old uniforms. I, remember, <laughs> I don't remember the ball field. I remember playing at the grade school, yeah. uh, the high school. And, and uh, some people were Boy Scout, Cub Scout teachers right there. Jack. Yeah. Yep. And their Dalmatian came from my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank our panelists. We've reached a, an hour limit here. And I want to say thank you for the audience today. Thank you for coming out on a rainy day. We don't expect a flood here this weekend, I hope. And uh, thanks to Art Sasaki, Laura Boone's Ferry Farmer family, Sandra Lafke Carlson, whose grandparents farmed on Lower Boone's Ferry, but also our historian for the Historical Society. Of course, Lois Martinez, co-author of our book, former president and the founder of the Society, and Michael Hannigan of the Hannigan family and the audience today with contributions. We appreciate your presence. Remind everyone that who are here are members of the Historical Society. Now's the time to renew your membership, if you have not. And also, I want to thank Tualatin Valley Community Television today for being here, recording this. It'll be posted uh, probably on their website or at least on ours at some point so that you can share this as well. So good to see you, and we hope you'll be involved with our society. And we want to thank Barbara and Michael for all their good newspaper articles. Right. Okay. Thanks again.